Ladies and gents, how is everyone? Good to see all you guys. We were supposed to be in Israel the past few weeks. That's why we didn't have any classes. Of course, that didn't happen. But um, hopefully things are getting better over there, although I don't know if that's the case. They released some more hostages today, did I hear? Are there any Americans in that release? Did we hear? Maybe one. One, one American? Yeah. I, I don't know why they're all not released, but there's been how many released so far? Like 30 maybe out of 200? Is that right? I don't know. I haven't been following it closely. Has anyone heard? Are you guys awake? Come on. Anyone watch the news? We don't know. Just like I don't know. Well, in any event, for those of you that haven't been here before, and for those of you watching out there on the Internet, what we've been doing is we've been going through a series called Digging Up the Bible. And we're going through the top archaeological discoveries in the Bible all the way from Genesis to maps to Revelation. And uh, right now we're about to talk more about the area of the kingdom around 1000 B.C. That would be people like Saul and David and Solomon. We covered some of that last time. There's so much in this program that we're leaving out. I can't even include it all. There's so much out there. But we're trying to highlight some of the major discoveries. And uh, when we're done here, uh, we'll take some questions, even some comments from people out there on the Internet if we can. And then we'll have prayer at the end. All right, let's dive right in because we've got a lot to cover tonight. Uh, I've been showing you a lot of this guy, Joel Kramer. Joel is an archaeologist who actually lives in Jordan. He lived in Israel for 10 years, but now he lives uh, near Amman, Jordan. And he can go to many of these sites himself, and he has. He has a YouTube channel called Expedition Bible. He has about 40 or so videos up there. I've shown you clips of some of them during this series. He's really clear, and uh, he goes to these sites, and he shows you what was discovered, how it was discovered, where it was discovered. He shows you the whole context. A lot of times he sends drones up and shows you exactly where everything is. So I highly recommend you check him out. He also has this book, Where God Came Down, the Archaeological Evidence. I just had him on the program earlier in November of 2023. For those of you watching this later, you can go to our YouTube channel or actually go to our uh, our app, the Cross-Examined app, and you can mine those podcasts. We did two podcasts with him. Anyway, Joel gives this analogy where he says, uh, suppose you found only, you had only a, a handful of pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, how could you put those pieces together without the box top? Be kind of hard to do, right? If you don't have all the pieces and if you don't have the box top, it's really hard to put all of it together. But if you have the box top, then you can see how some of these pieces or maybe all the pieces fit together. And what Joel says is archaeology, particularly biblical archaeology, is a lot like that. You have just a few pieces of maybe, say, a 500-piece jigsaw puzzle. And you know what the box top is to it? The Bible. If you use the Bible to try and interpret the little pieces you find, you will see that the puzzle fits together quite well. The problem is we only have a handful of pieces from the biblical record. Why? Because only about 1% of Holy Land has been excavated. And only about 1% of the sites that have been excavated have been excavated, let me put it another way, only 1% of the sites that have been excavated have been dug up. In other words, there's 99% of the sites that actually haven't been dug up. And only about 1% of those have been written up. So we're dealing with a minuscule amount of data when it comes to biblical archaeology. But what we do find is when we do get something, it lines up with what the Bible says. And we're going to look at some of those details here tonight. He, Joel says, if you find the box top to the puzzle, you can see how it all fits together, even if you don't have all the pieces, even if you only have some of the pieces. And all we have is some of the pieces. By the way, when somebody says, well, that couldn't have happened because X, 
Y or Z hasn't been found, is that a good argument? No, why? Because that would be an argument from silence, and the absence, or I should say, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because you haven't found it doesn't mean it's not out there, especially when only 1% of the sites have been excavated and only 1% of the sites that have been excavated have, have been excavated um, to 1%, and only 1% of those have been written up. So you've got very little data to go by, but the data we do have actually conforms with what the Bible says. And last time we were in here, we talked a little bit about David and Goliath. And here are some of the discoveries just from 10,000 feet we'll review. Remember, we actually have a writing and a straka, meaning a piece of pottery with the name Goliath on it, found in uh, the area where Goliath was from. Now, do we know this is the Goliath? No, we don't, but it is interesting we have that name. We also pointed out that what Goliath was wearing and what he was using has been found archaeologically. We talked about the serpentine sort of armor he had. That has been found in two places. One of the places it's been found is under the gate in the city of Gath, which is where Goliath was from. This is actually a picture of the serpentine armor from another site north of Gath. And also these huge, this particular spear here, point, is 26 inches long, and it shows signs of being, of being actually used. It's not just decorative. So we found these huge weapons that a normal person wouldn't probably be using. Uh, we also, uh, as we pointed out last time, found uh, the city of, or I should say the house of David in an inscription by a king from what we now would call Syria. And he says that he had defeated the house of David. Prior to this discovery in 1993, many archaeologists who what we call minimalists, these are people that don't think there's much true in the Bible historically, said, ah, this guy David never existed. Then we find him in an inscription from a Syrian king. Aram was the area. Now we call it Syria. Okay? And then we talked also about the Moabite stone. This is what we talked about last time. This is a stone that was found in Jordan in an area that was once known as Moab, and the Moabite king, Mesha, it was his victory, Stella, or Stila, over Israel. Because Israel had settled in that area, and what this guy says is, I killed them. I came in and I took the land back. In fact, it mentions 12 people, places, or events in the Bible, including Omri, the king of Israel. It mentions, of course, himself, Mesha, the king of Moab. It, messes the Hebrew, it mentions the Hebrew tribe of Gad. That was the tribe in that area of what we now call Jordan. It mentions their god, Kamosh, the Moabite god. It mentions Yahweh, the Israelite god. It mentions the Moabite rebellion, which occurred in Joram's reign in the 840s. doesn't mention Joram by name, but this occurred in the 840s B.C. And it also mentions the house of David, just like the Dan, the, the, the Dan Stella, the Stella found in the northern city known as Dan. So this is a foreign king who puts all this in his victory Stella. By the way, the victory Stella says that he went into this area and he killed everybody, including the pregnant women and the children. He killed 7,000 of them in one day. What does that make you think of? Well, the Bible talks like this. We wiped everybody out. We exterminated the men, the women, and the children. And then we read right after that in the Bible, well, then don't intermarry with these people after you wipe them out and you're going, this is in Deuteronomy 7. Hey, if you wiped everybody out, why would, how could you intermarry with them anyway? This was ancient Near East trash talk is what it was. This is the way these people spoke, that they obliterated their opponents. Even the Merneptah we talked about earlier. It says Israel's seed is laid waste. Merneptah, the pharaoh from one of the pharaohs from Egypt said, he laid Israel's seed waste. They, they're no more. They don't exist anymore. Of course, they, they still existed. He's just bragging that he, that he beat them soundly.
but they make it seem like nobody has survived. This is just the way they bragged about things. In fact, back in uh, the time of Sennacherib and others, which we'll get to later, they would say the same kind of thing. These people were brutal, and they would brag about how they did all these brutal things to their opponents. We'll see this later. Now, isn't it interesting that when the Nazis did what they did, they actually hid it. You notice that? They kept it real quiet. When Eisenhower went into that first camp that he discovered, I think it may have been Buchenwald, he went behind his Jeep, he puked, and then he said, I want everybody in this town to walk through this concentration camp. You need to see what's been going on right in your own hometown. If you're going to deny this has happened, we're going to show it to you. The Nazis were hiding this. Isn't it interesting that Hamas doesn't hide it? They brag about it. It's as if they're in ancient times. They show it on live stream. This one guy, how many people, how many Jews did he kill when he called home to his mother and said, I killed 10 of them with my own hands? And his mother was proud. What's that about? I submit to you that all of us in here would be capable of doing that. I submit to all of us in here would probably be Nazi guards if we were in Germany at the time. You know, they've done research into genocide. Every genocide researcher will tell you this is true. Every act of genocide was carried out by normal, everyday people. They're monsters! No, they're just human beings. You'd probably do it. I'd probably do it. Why? Just because that's what you did. You protected yourself. That's why we need a savior, by the way. So, these details we've already seen. What about details, more details, related to people like Saul and David and Solomon? Well, let's reset where we are in the entire scheme of biblical history. Uh, we've covered everything up to about this point right now, the kingdom. This is 1050 B.C. This is when Saul, David, and Solomon are the three kings that follow in succession. Saul is the first king of Israel, as you know. He takes the throne about 1050 or so B.C. David takes it in about 1010 B.C. And then Solomon takes it in about 970 B.C. And by, the time, by about 931, so what's that, 119 years or so? 119 years later, the kingdom splits. After Solomon, they can't hold it together. There are 10 northern tribes and two tribes in the south for Judah. But we're going to talk right about here in the 11th, 10th century B.C. And what we're going to try and do tonight is just look at details. These are not huge discoveries. But there are small discoveries that seem to corroborate what the Bible says about history. And so we're going to see if, are there archaeological details that corroborate Israel becoming a monarchy during Saul's life? Secondly, the location of the David versus Goliath battle. We're going to see that the geography and the topography of all this is actually true. What the Bible says about it is true and can be verified. How the Bible, or how I should say, David's men took the Jebusite fortress. Jebusite. We'll get into that. What is the, who are the Jebusites and where is this? It turns out to be Jerusalem. What is the location of David's palace near there, near the fortress? And finally, what are some minor and major people in the Old Testament that can be confirmed by uh, certain inscriptions that we found. So let's start right here at point one. Do we have any evidence that Israel became a monarchy during Saul's life? First of all, here's a real modest discovery related to Saul. 
Again, Saul lived from about 1082 to 1010 BC, took the throne in about 1050 BC. And here's a passage you might not have ever read because you probably don't read through Chronicles. It's mostly uh, a lot of genealogies. And one of the genealogies deals with Saul. It says, Saul became the father of Jonathan, Malchai Shua, Abinadad, and Eshbal. This is 1 Chronicles 8.33. Keep an eye on this name right here. This is one of Saul's sons you don't hear about. And what we're going to do is show you the location that we're going to be looking at. This is Jerusalem over here to the right side of the screen. And uh, you see Lachish. We'll get to that uh, in a future show. This is Ascalon, and here's Gaza. Yeah, the current Gaza that, that we're talking about in the, in the news. Uh, this area right here, though, is where we're going to go. We're going to go to a, a, a town, actually a fortress, on the top of a hill called Kerbet Kayafa, which is an Arabic name. Nobody really knows what the name means. But in the Bible, we think that this town is called Shearim. I don't know if I'm even pronouncing that right. But you'll see why here in a minute. This fortress, I've been to this place, because when you go to Israel, if you go into the land of Judah, you'll probably go to this place. And it's an ancient fortress that overlooks Elah, the valley where David fought Goliath. So David fought Goliath down in this valley here, and on the top of this hill is this fortress. And what has been found in this fortress? Well... They found an inscription called Ishbal, son of Beda, on this jar. And it was found in this town, in this fortress, overlooking the Elah Valley. It was only found uh, in 2012. And uh, here's the significance of this. At this place, a shattered jar was found with a name carved into it. And it's an early Hebrew script that says... Ishbal, could also be spelled with an E, is the same name, obscure name, as Saul's son. Now, this is not Saul's son because this is the son of Beda, but this was an obscure name. And this name is dated to about 3,000 years ago. That pot is dated to 3,000 years ago, the pottery. And it would have been in Saul and David's time no later. How do we know it's not later? Because the ball ending fell out of use by the Israelites after the time of Saul. You didn't want to call your son such and such Baal. Why? Because Baal was a false god. And so despite the fact that there are about 2,000 inscriptions from the 9th to the 6th century B.C., there's none of them that have this Baal ending for an Israelite. But we find it. Prior to that, we find it in Saul's time. And this is the actual inscription that you see right at the top, right here. What's the biblical significance of this? First of all, it attests to the Israelite occupation there by 1000 BC. Remember, we talked long before about the minimalists and the maximalists. The minimalists don't think there's much history in the Bible. The maximalists say, no, there's plenty of history in the Bible. Well, the minimalists for years said, this can't be. Uh, an Israelite camp because Israel didn't really have a kingdom. David uh, really didn't exist, or if he did, he was just a local chieftain, maybe in Jerusalem. Well, that has been put to bed, it seems, by archaeology. As we'll see here in a minute, it attests to an early Israelite literacy. In other words, they had a written Hebrew language as early as 1000 B.C., even prior to 1000 B.C., and again, these are just details. It shows the writer of 1 Chronicles must have had an early source to know this name from 500 to 600 years earlier because the writer of Chronicles, 1 Chronicles, is writing sometime between, say, 500 B.C. and 400 B.C. because he's chronicling all of Israel history, which hadn't happened yet, obviously, by 1,000 B.C. So how does he know the right name for this guy at which you find in 1 Chronicles 8, as I mentioned earlier, how does he have the right name? I mean, think about the names that are popular right now in America. 
If you go to the, here's one of the things the government does well. It tracks what names people use, like what are the most common names. What are the most common names for, say, girls right now? Well, I don't know if Karen is anymore. Nice try. <laughs> nice try. No, really, when, when, you, when, when, a, when there's a kid born now, what are, what are common girl names? Taylor might be one. Uh, you could look it up. I don't know what they are off the top of my head, but I know it's not Mary. 1950, 1960, most popular name in America was Mary. Now it might not even be in the top 200, okay? Same thing is true with boys. Who names their kid Frank anymore? Maybe it's coming back. I don't know. But I'm one of the few Franks I know, to be frank with you. And... Uh, Names change, right? What, what are the cool names now? Is it, I don't know, is it Liam? Huh? Huh? Chad, Brad's coming back. Liam, you know, Noah. Maybe even that's a little old now. I mean, those names came back, right? Names change all the time. In fact, this is an argument in the New Testament as well. Richard Balkum, who's a brilliant researcher over in the UK, did a book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. And what he does is he shows that the names in the New Testament are the right names for that period in the Holy Land. Where if he, uh, the, the names at that time in, say, Egypt for Jewish people were different than the ones in Jerusalem at the time. So there's no way somebody who was writing, say, 50, 100 years later would have known the right names if they were making it all up. And that appears to be the case right here. How does this guy know, 500 to 600 years after the fact, this name? He must have had an early source. All right. So let's stay with Saul now. And do we have any evidence that this guy was actually king or that at least a kingdom was uh, created in Israel? 1 Samuel 10, Samuel said to all the people, do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is none like him, Saul, among all the people. Then the people shouted, long live the king. Let's stay in the same place. We're still at Kerbet Kiafa, okay? This fortress above the Elah Peninsula, or I should say, say the Elah Valley, over the valley where David fought Goliath. And what they found in here was an estraca, again, a piece of pottery that had writing on it. And this is from 1000 BC. And uh, it shows an early Hebrew Canaanite script. It's really hard to figure out the difference between the two, so we're not exactly sure. The text is faded and hard to read. However, it appears to say, at least in one part, the men and the chiefs or officers have established a king here in the land, among other things. And this is the first king. It's not a succession. It's not a father passing the kingdom down to his son. This appears to be the first king in this area. And this message seems to be from an authority to a local leader, and it applies the recipient must obey. In other words, they're basically saying, you know this long period of judges we had where everyone you know, was, had their own tribal leader in their own area? Well, that's over now. We got a king. And we've just established this king. And you guys need to obey this. And in fact, one famous uh, expert in this area from France put it this way. This translation of this astrakhan contained all the essential components of the biblical tale on the transition from judges to the selection of Saul as the leader of a new kingdom of Israel. Now there is going to be the minimalists who are going to dispute this of course, but this is found in an area that they didn't even think Israel had control over. But it appears they did. This is a fortress, again, overlooking this area. What's the biblical significance? Maximally, it corroborates how Israel transitions from the area of judges to the early monarchy under King Saul. Minimally, it at least shows that the Israelites in 1000 BC were literate. They had some sort of language, some Hebrew script. They had a king and a kingdom far beyond Jerusalem, and they shared borders with the Philistines in the Elah Valley. Now, this is 
critical uh, for the next point because the next point we're going to talk about the location of David uh, versus the location of the David versus Goliath battle. Remember, we said this fortress overlooks that area. Well, notice what it says in 1 Samuel 17. This is right after David kills Goliath. It says this When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharaim as far as Gath and Ekron. And you say, so what? What does this have to do with anything? Okay, take a look at this. Again, here's, here's our map. Here's Sharaim right here. It's overlooking the valley where David fought Goliath, and it says they pursued them all the way to Gath and then all the way to Ekron from this place, Sharaim. What is Sharaim? What does that even mean in Hebrew? Sharaim is a word that means two gates. This fortress on the top of this hill has two gates. This is the only ancient site they've discovered that has two gates. Normally, you don't want to have more than two gates. Why? Or more than one gate. Why? Yeah, points of entry. That's the weak part of the fort, right? Where somebody can get in. Why would you have two gates? This place has two gates. It's the only city with two gates. By the way, they found 3,000 bones, but no pig bones. What's that telling you? This is a Hebrew site. You go to the next hill over and you excavate it, which is a Philistine site, you're going to find pig bones because they ate pigs. The Hebrews didn't. Also, it's dated to the time of Saul. So this fortress means two gates. And if they find two gates, this two-gated city at the top, it appears that they're identifying that as the place, the fort, that they held while David took out Goliath. And then they pursued the Philistines from that site all the way to Gath, Goliath's hometown, and then up to Ekron. These are just details, right? But the Bible gets it right. They're not making it up. All these details check out. All right, how about the third point? How about David's men when they took the fortress? Are there any details about that that can be corroborate that can corroborate the story? For this we got to go to 2 Samuel 5 and we're going to stay in 2 Samuel 5 most of the rest of the way. So if you got a Bible, this is a Bible study. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 5. Now, when David became king in about 10, 10 or so B.C., where was his capital? It wasn't Jerusalem. Anyone know? It was Hebron, okay? And I think he stayed there about seven or so years. But then he came to what we now call Jerusalem, okay? So now we're talking about King David who lived from about 1040 to about 970 B.C., now, when you think about Jerusalem, you think about this, right? You think about the Dome of the Rock, the Old City. Uh, this is the Temple Mount, as you know. This is what we think about when we think about Jerusalem, at least most people do. But at the time of David, this did not exist, okay? There was no Old City of Jerusalem. The Old City of Jerusalem was the city of David, which is south of what we now call the Temple Mount. And it may be 10 to 12 acres. It looks like almost a peninsula, even though there's no water on the, on the side of it. But this kind of thing just juts out off the southern wall of the old city. But this wall didn't exist. None of this existed in David's time. This just existed. This was the city that the Jebusites had that they held. And David went to this city, also called Salem, as you know, to win it over. And here's what it says in 2 Samuel chapter 5. 
The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, they're up in the fort. <laughs> they have this fort. And they're looking down at David. And they say to him, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. In other words, this place is so secure, we could be blind and lame. And we're going to be able to defend this site. You're not going to be able to get in. So they're basically at the top of the fort just yelling down at him and mocking him. Kind of like the guy in Monty Python, right? <laughs> Doing the same thing. Mocking them. And they thought, David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion in the city of David. Now, I don't know if there's any significance to this, but check this out. They say, even the blind and the lame can ward you off. Jesus, where did Jesus do most of his miracles? Not in Jerusalem. Most of them up in the Galilee. He did three miracles in Jerusalem. Of course, the biggest one, the resurrection. But there were two others he did. Does anyone know what they are? Okay, he healed the blind and the lame. He healed the blind guy and sent him to the pool of Siloam. John chapter 9. Where's the pool of Siloam? Eli Shukran, our guide when we go to Israel, discovered that in 2004. It's at the bottom of the city of David. In fact, let me just go back a slide. It's down here. It's the Pool of Silo. He discovered it. The other site at which Jesus healed somebody was another pool, the Pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. That pool today is up here. Uh, so on the other side of the Temple Mount, it's right in this area, okay? Those are the only two miracles Jesus did. Other than the resurrection is he healed a blind man and he healed a lame man. I, again, I don't know if there's any significance, but I just find it interesting <laughs> that those are the two things they point out. So, you're never going to get in here, they say. And it says that David captured the fortress anyway. How did he capture it? The next verse tells you. It says... On that day, David had said, anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and the lame will not enter the palace. Well, guess what? They discovered the water shaft. It's called Warren Shaft. What's Warren Shaft? Warren Shaft, first of all, it's named after Sir Charles Warren, who in 1867 went to this area. He was a British general, an engineer, an archaeologist, and he uncovered this 40 feet deep shaft way back in 1867. On the edge of the city of David, it gave access to the Gion Spring from inside the old Jebusite walls. Now, the Gion Spring is the only water source, a spring in Jerusalem, and it's on the east side of the city of David. This is the same spring that Hezekiah built the temple or built the tunnel from to bring that water inside the city. Because he knew Sennacherib, who had just ta had taken over most of Israel's fortified cities at the time, he knew that he was coming to Jerusalem at some point. And so Hezekiah said, man, we got to build a tunnel to make sure that we have water if he sieges the city. So he built Hezekiah's tunnel. Well, attached to Hezekiah's tunnel is this shaft that existed prior to Hezekiah building his tunnel. And the later excavation uncovered several more tunnels with an extensive water system for the city of David. Here's, there's a couple of different ways of looking at this. Here's one picture of it. This Jebusite city wall, which we're about to see a little bit more of here in a few minutes, um, is on the surface because this area slopes down from the top of the city of David down toward the Kidron Valley. And this is Warren Shaft. This is Hezekiah's Tunnel. This is the Gion Spring, not springs. There's only one spring. And uh, they connected, somebody connected a shaft here so if you're inside the fortress, you could get water without going outside the walls. 
and Warren discovered it. Here's another look at it. This is Warren's shaft. You can see there's kind of a tiered uh, sloping, or a, a, there's a bunch of terraces that tier into this slope that people would build these walls so they could, could live on this tiered area, on this sloping area. But underneath is this shaft that brought them again down to the Guillaume Spring. Now, when you go there today, you can go into Hezekiah's Tunnel. Has anyone done that? Yeah, you've been in Hezekiah's Tunnel. It's, I want to say it's uh, 1,700 feet. Am I thinking it's that long? Does anyone know the exact length of it? It is long. It takes a while to get through it, especially if there are slow people in front of you. Yeah. And uh, it's a beautiful, I mean, it's always running. It's some, it's, this spring just keeps bringing water into this area. And so this fed the Pool of Siloam. Uh, that's where the, the, the tunnel ultimately uh, goes to. And it was a, a source of fresh water and still is in that area. In any event, this shaft, what's the biblical significance? Again, these are just details. Supports what David says in 2 Samuel 5.8, as we just pointed out, which says the only way you're going to get in is go up this shaft. It's a water shaft. It's no mere tunnel. It accesses the Jebusite fortress, and it bypasses their walls, and it's big enough that people can climb through it. So this has been discovered. We know what David said there in 2 Samuel. Samuel chapter 5 actually checks out in the dirt. They went up a shaft, and the one general climbed up the shaft, as you know, and they took the site, and ever since then, that's been the capital of Israel, of Judah. All right, what about the location of David's palace near this area? Did David build a palace? I mean, he takes the site, right? He takes the fortress. What's he going to do then? Well, he's got to build a house, right? Well, we're looking from the east to the west, city of David. See all these buses up here? Yeah, in normal times, there are buses everywhere, tour buses. Um, <clears throat> this is the north this way, the south this way, east coming to you, west going that way. This is the city of David. Normally, they... they Drive you up here, you get off the bus, you just walk down this street, and you go into this area, which since this picture was taken has been built up. There's a structure here. This is the City of David Visitor Center. And when you go to the City of David Visitor Center, you start there, and then you go and see uh, all that has been discovered under the City of David, which is quite a lot. You also see this area right here but before i do let's read what it says david then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of david he built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward this is called the millow what's the millow the millow we think now after much research means this supporting terrace right here do you see how this looks like a retaining wall in fact, you can go in a little bit closer. You can see this area. We're about to see that David's palace was discovered attached to this supporting wall. And it was just discovered <clears throat> within the past 20 years. So he built his residence, and the archaeologist who did it thinks he built this wall too. Why? We'll see here in a minute. These terraces come from 1000 BC. They're originally discovered by Robert McAllister in the 1920s. I think this is the same guy that we looked at previously, the guy who discovered in Gezer the infant babies that were sacrificed in Gezer by the Amorites. Same guy. He goes to Jerusalem and he starts excavating and he discovers this these terraces, this steeped Milo, they call it, and he uncovered it in the 20s. He thought it was a Jebusite ramp when he first discovered it. And in the 1960s, Kathleen Kenyon, the same archaeologist that we talked about earlier who also excavated Jericho, dated this to David's time, about 1000 B.C. <clears throat> Others in the 1970s and 80s, and 80s uh, conjecture that this may just be a retaining wall. They probably were right. 
But in 20, uh, 2005, archaeologist Elliot Mazur, and we'll, we'll introduce her to you in a minute, revealed that the terraces interlocked with David's palace walls, as it says in 2 Samuel 5.9. Here's the drawing that this lady and her team put together. <clears throat> this steep stone structure comes down, and it's retaining a foundation we'll talk about in a minute. But what Mazur, Dr. Mazur discovered was interlocking with this wall at the very top, this blue area here, she believes was David's palace that he built after he took the city. Now, who is this lady? <clears throat> she is the granddaughter of Benjamin Mazur, who many believe is the dean of biblical archaeology, because after the 1967 war in 1968, Mazur, her grandfather, began to excavate in the Afel, which is the area just to the north of this, before you get to the old city, and he discovered quite a bit. This is her <clears throat> with him, obviously much younger. This is a recent picture, although she died just about a year and a half or two years ago. And in 2005, she went into this area. We'll explain how she did it. There are two passages also in 2 Samuel chapter 5 that are critical here. And, and she just, she's following what the Bible says to discover this stuff. She says from 2 Samuel 5 verse 11, it says, Now Huron, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built not just a house, but a palace for David. So where's Tyre? Does anyone know? <clears throat> it's up on the coast, what we would now call either Lebanon or Syria. I think it's Lebanon. It's to the north. So this king up there is friend somehow with David, and he sends stonemasons and other carpenters down to help David build his palace. A few verses later, it says, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him, but David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. All right, remember these two verses because we're going <clears> to <throat> see how her discoveries confirm these two verses, corroborate these two verses. Let's see what she found here. She theorized way back in 1998 using the biblical data that David's palace must be on the east side of Mount Zion at the summit. Mount Zion being the city of David. It's got to be on the east side, she thought. <clears throat> so the excavation didn't begin until 2005. She had trouble getting money, and there were a lot of anti-David skeptics saying, come on, David probably didn't even exist, even though... The Stella of the Dan Stella, the Tell Dan Stella, had been discovered already. But there's still naysayers. There are people that don't want to believe that the Bible's telling the truth. So she had trouble getting funding, but she ultimately got it. Within weeks, she found evidence of the palace. What did she find? She found thick fortress-sized walls up to 20 feet thick and 90 feet long. So 20 feet thick, what's that? From here past the cameras, right? And up to 90 feet long. These are some serious walls. This isn't just somebody's house, right? This is a palace or a fortress of some kind. <clears throat> These interlocked with a giant step stone structure, again called the millo, also known as the terraces. We just saw those. And the millo or these terraces, hold a foundation in a gap of bedrock north of the Jebusite fortress. In other words, when she began digging, she realized that there was a gap between <clears throat> the Jebusite fortress and the area to the north heading up toward the Temple Mount. And she said the only way anybody could build in this area would be to put a whole bunch of fill in there and shore it up with a wall. That's exactly what she found. And she found pottery in this dirt area where the, the, the gap in the bedrock was that dated it to the time 
of David. In fact, here's what she said. I mean, you ever had a retaining wall put in? Okay, we got heavy equipment now. We had a retaining wall <clears throat> put in our backyard. It's a pretty long stretch with, um, I don't know, it's maybe six to eight feet high in certain areas. And it probably took them two weeks to do it, right, with all the equipment that they needed to do. Used to be railroad ties in there, and, you know, they started rotting, so we had to put a real retaining wall in. No heavy equipment. This retaining wall or this stepstone structure uh, is at least 20 meters high. So that's what? It's over 60 feet high, right? And um, could an average Joe just do this? No, right? You'd need a team to do this. You'd need some money to do this. Where are they getting all this rock from? How are they getting it there? How are they putting it in? How are they getting all the fill? Here's what Mazur says about it. Bridging this gap in the bedrock would require, to use Dr. Mazur's words, the audacity and vision of a determined central ruling authority to devote enormous resources to build such a brace descending down into the Kidron Valley. This has to be somebody that has the wherewithal and the authority to build this thing. And the last point in this is notice artifacts and scientific dating put the construction at 1000 BC. That's the time of David. In other words, Mazur's saying, or Mazur is saying, David built this. This is David's wall. This is David's palace. And the minimalists will still try and say, no, 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 can't be. What else is it then? By the way, <clears throat> let's go back to that verse we had earlier. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointing king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. He's building outside the stronghold. The city's crowded. He takes it over. So he's building to the north of the stronghold. It doesn't have bedrock, so he puts a wall up, fills it in, puts a wall up, the stepstone structure. And then when he hears the Philistines want to kill him, he goes from here down into the fortress. Actually, these are just details, but let's, let's look at it again. This is, the, this is the, <clears throat> the fortress he's built, the palace he's built. He goes down into the fortress. This whole, this, you can see how this whole thing slopes down. That's the whole city of David. It just slopes down. So again, minor detail, but he protects himself by going into the Jebusite fortress. Now notice the tiered structure all the way down to the Kidron Valley. This is one long, big slope. Do you see how David saw Bathsheba? He's up here, looking down where all the people live. When we were over there, <clears throat> we're, we're right here at this little hut. It's been redesigned since this picture was taken, but this, this kind of little observatory hut is still there. And we're, I'm, I'm holding a microphone with Ellie Shukron. You can see it on our YouTube channel. And he's describing, he's going, you see how this is tiered? And how David could easily see from his high point anybody down there, including Bathsheba. And he goes, you Americans think Bathsheba must have been naked. He says, why? Do you have to be naked to fall in love with somebody? Or do you have to have somebody naked in order to fall in love with them? No. He says she was bathing. Well, does that mean she had all her clothes off? He said, it could have been a foot bath. We found foot baths up there. Or if she was bathing, do you think she knew that people up higher than her could see her? I mean, it's not necessarily so that she was naked, right? 
Whether she was naked or not, she must have been beautiful, and David saw her, and you know the rest. You know the rest of the story. But again, just the topography of this shows you and enlightens you as to how some of these other biblical stories fit into this. It corroborates. It doesn't prove it. It just corroborates that, yeah, we could see how this could happen. Again, it's just details, but the details fit. When you have the box top, you can see how the details fall into place. So, what's the biblical significance of finding David's palace? Not only does this corroborate the biblical account of David, but it's further evidence that the biblical archaeologists have a practical advantage over anti-biblical and minimalist archaeologists. It supports an historical David, a house of David, and Israel's United Kingdom. In fact, when, when I had Joel Kramer on the show recently... We talked a little bit about Jericho, and he, he pointed out that most archaeologists today who get involved in biblical archaeology don't have a biblical worldview. They're minimalists. They're against saying that the Bible's true. Doesn't mean they're necessarily wrong in saying that, but I think when you look at the evidence, I think they are wrong. But they have this bias against what the Bible says. And when we got started, we started talking about Jericho, which we've already covered here, he said, I said, tell us about Jericho, Joel. You know, this is really controversial. He says, it shouldn't be. Why should it be controversial? We found, just as the Bible says, that the walls fell down flat. There's no other city we know about where that has happened. You're arguing over pottery dating? Why are you arguing over pottery dating? Why are you assuming the pottery dating is accurate and the Bible isn't? Why do we have all different archaeologists come to different conclusions on the pottery dating, but everybody agrees the walls fell flat? This is a no-brainer, he says. He says, but biblical archaeology has gotten more and more stupid because they think some sort of scientific method is going to somehow figure out what happened when the best way to figure out what happened is to open the scriptures. You don't even have to assume they're the word of God. Just open them, read them, and see what it says and see if that fits what you find in the dirt. And as we talked about when we talked about Jericho, that must be an eyewitness account. Because nobody writing a thousand years later would know what happened to the walls. They couldn't have just invented that. Somebody must have seen what happened or had been given information as to what happened. Because, you know, the minimalists will say, oh, Joshua was written, you know, hundreds of years later. Really? How do they have all these details right? In the dirt. I mean, it wasn't excavated until the 20th century. Nobody could have known what was in the dirt prior to that. So it must be an eyewitness account. Now you say, well, really? I mean, you sure this is David's palace? Well, there's more evidence. Remember we talked about Haram, the Phoenician king of Tyre, sent envoys to David along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built the palace for David? Does anyone know what that is? That's a capital. You find it at the top of a column and in this case, it's a proto-aeolic, meaning prior to Greek capitals. And it was originally discovered by Kathleen Kenyon in the city of David, right where Mazer was doing her excavations. And it refers to the capstone on a column. Obviously, we're inserting the, the column here. That's not original. It was cataloged by Kenyon, rediscovered by Mazer. And this, this uh, column style dates to 1000 B.C. all the way up to 562 B.C. It's well crafted and carved from one piece of stone. It's believed to be a royal fixture as in a palace. In fact, here's what Mazer herself said. She said an elegant proto-aeolic capital had been found literally at the foot of the scarp at the south e southeastern edge of the structure in Area H. That's where she dug. That's what she thinks the palace is. And this was just the kind of impressive remains that one would expect to come from a 10th century BCE, before the Common Era, 
king's palace. What's the significance of this? First of all, it fits the timeline of the Davidic monarchy. It points out a royal palace in the city of David, right where Mazur predicted, and it aligns with 2 Samuel 5.11, the verse we just read, that the Phoenician stonemasons helped with the palace. They were famous for doing this. So when you find it in the dirt, you go, man, again, this is just another detail. This is probably from David's palace or an adjoining building. So this little offhanded comment where the writer of, of 2 Samuel says, oh yeah, the king of Tyre came down, he sent down his stonemasons and his carpenters, and then you go in to the area and you find a product that they would have made, you go, man, it's just another detail. Now, these capitals have been found elsewhere. They've been found in Megiddo, up to the north, and other areas around Israel. But here you're making a direct connection, it seems, between what the Bible says in 2 Samuel 5 and what you find again in the dirt. That's not going to be in somebody's house, right? That's going to be in a palace or some glorious government building of some kind. All right, the final one we'll cover tonight. What major, minor and major people are found in the Old Testament? In the, at this site, actually. There's, there's many. We're, we've talked about some already, and we're going to talk about some in future uh, sessions. But what was found in the dirt near David's palace? There were many royal items discovered in and around the palace. They were ornate ivory utensils and the remains of exotic foods, likewise indicating the royal nature of the structure. And the bula of two princes. Bula, what are bula? They're seals. These things right here that have the names of certain people on them. They would use these to seal a message. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. These seals are seals of obscure minor people named in the Bible. Particular. And you dig in the royal area and you find their seals. I mean, come on. <laughs> These are this is not, you know, David, but it's obscure people that the Bible talks about. Now, when is Jeremiah writing? Well, he's writing in around 586 or so BC. This is 400 years after David. But the area is still being used as the king's palace, or at least an administrative center. There are two others here as well, also obscure characters. One of them is disputed. One of them is Baruch. And uh, the other, what's the other one's name? Uh, Gamaria, son of Saphian. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing them right. And then Baruch, son of Neorah. Those are the other two that are also found in Jeremiah. So you find these four obscure people named in Jeremiah, and then you find their, their seals in the dirt. Now, if you go to the Afel, which is just to the north of this area, just before you get to what is now the old city wall, so right below the old city wall, Eliot Mazer, or Mazer went there after she excavated in the city of David and found David's palace. And she found two more Bula, which we'll talk about later, but I'm just going to mention them now. She found the seal to the prophet Isaiah. And three feet from that seal, she also found the seal to King Hezekiah. Three feet away in the same strata. And those two people were contemporaneous. As when we get there later, we're going to see that Isaiah was the guy who was advising, the prophet that was advising Hezekiah when Sennacherib was trying to destroy Jerusalem in 701 B.C. He had it surrounded after he had taken every other city in Judah. And it's Isaiah saying, stand firm against this guy. God will deliver you. So we find not only minor people in Bula, 
we also find major people in Bula. So what do they answer all these questions? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> we find all this in the dirt. All these little details show you that we have this jigsaw puzzle. We just have a few of the pieces, but we also have the box top. And the box top is the Bible. And if you use the box top properly when you're digging in the dirt, you're going to be able to figure out what's going on. All right? All right. Questions? Comments? And we need the microphone, and it will come up here to Scott first. <coughs> yeah, go ahead, Scott. Hello. Does anybody have a feel for how well the Bible serves as the box top? Version? And go to Palmyra, New York, or wherever the... Book of Mormon says uh, the Israelites were. I mean, you don't find any archaeology that affirms the Book of Mormon. Um, the Quran, I, I'm not sure about the Quran, but the Quran is, is only dealing with a very short period of time, as you know. I mean, Muhammad gets his so-called first revelation in 610 A.D. He takes uh, Medina in 620, say 630, and then he dies in 632. So it's not covering a long period of time. If there is any archaeological stuff in there, okay, you might expect that. There were historical things going on. But the Bible is covering thousands of years. And so there's a lot more time period to work with. And the more you go through it, the more you begin to realize nothing that has ever been found in archaeology contradicts any, anything in the Bible. It only seems to affirm it. But again, we're dealing with a very small section of the Holy Land being excavated. 1% maybe. All right. Who else? Oh, come on. That can't be it. Go to DJ right there. We can go online too. Maybe... Uh, <clears throat> We can take some folks out there who have questions. Go ahead, DJ. Uh, could that have been a reason why Muhammad was so intent on building, like, the Dome of the Rock and some of his other Well, Muhammad things? didn't build the Dome of the Rock. As we'll see in the next session, the Dome of the Rock was built in about 692 A.D. Muhammad had been dead for about 60 years. So it was a, uh, a caliph that came in. I'm trying to remember his name. I can't remember off the top of my head. But he actually asked the bishop of the area... I want to build a shrine. Where should I build it? And he said, build it here because this is where uh, the temple was for the Jews. So it's built right where the Jews had their temple. But as we'll see in the next, in the next lesson, on that site, Mount Moriah, there were two altars, two temples, and two shrines built there. The two altars, or the two altars were Abraham's and David's. The two uh, temples were Solomon's and Zerubbabel's, and Herod just expanded and beautified Zerubbabel's. And then the two shrines were Hadrian's and in the second century A.D., and later the Dome of the Rock in 692 A.D. But, but with that said, because, um, I mean, there's the constant conflict. Uh, have, have you been to the... Have you been inside of the inside of the Muslim? I have not been inside of the Dome of the Rock. They used to allow you to go in there. They don't allow you anymore, although there are some people I know that do get in to the Dome of the Rock. We'll talk about the Dome of the Rock in the next session because we're going to go to Solomon and Solomon's Temple and all that, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about it then. But that, that was just put up in 692. Well, that's when it was finished. Uh, it's a beautiful structure if you look at it. Uh, it's just amazing uh, work in there. But it's built because that's where the Jews had their temple, which is just commemorating where the temple was. In fact, Hadrian's shrine was the same thing. He had a shrine to himself, and I think the god Jupiter. He's just marking the place. <laughs> so uh, later, people would come along, yep, this is, where the, this is where the temple must have been. They didn't lose that memory, right? Anybody else? Hank, did you have something? I thought, thought a hand came up over here. We got anything online? Okay. Hey, people online, you want to jump in, go ahead. We've got a quiet group here tonight. Yeah, I, was, I was definitely given the Bible 
We need uh, we need the, the mic, Jeff, because people online. Go ahead. I was just going to make a comment. Mm -hmm. um, when Ellie was here that I seen last, um, mm -hmm. he was talking about the city of David, and he was yep. talking about how he found layers of, um, I guess, uh, burnt layers. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they you know came down and burnt the city, mm -hmm. something like that. And um, so, I mean, it's it's amazing how much information he has, and it's only 1% or, or whatever of what's out well, there. Well, the city of David has been excavated more than most other sites, so it's probably been excavated right. more, certainly more than 1%. But still, there's a lot they can't excavate. Why? Because people are living there, sure. right? You just yeah. can't go into somebody's house and go, I'm going to dig through your floor right. <laughs> and see what's under there, right? Yeah. So, but there has been a lot excavated. And when you go to these excavation sites, you see all these steel beams. You're going, who put in these steel beams? You know, put the steel beams in in Ellie's site, his brother. Because <laughs> his brother <laughs> right. had a business of doing that. He was a construction guy, so he brings his brother in to put all these steel beams in to hold up the earth above him so he can dig out and the whole thing isn't going to cave in. Same thing is true when you go to the, uh, to the city of David <clears throat> uh, Welcome Center. Uh, below that is the palace, and everything is held up by steel beams. This, this has been built up now, but down here, the, <laughs> there's all sorts of steel beams in here to hold up this structure built above it. So yeah. it's, uh, it's been excavated quite a bit, but there's more to do. In fact, they're now excavating this, the uh, Pool of Siloam. Ellie was only able to excavate it um, slightly into the pool area because there was a church that had the property there and they didn't want him excavating anymore for whatever reason, I don't know. But hmm. just over just last year, they were given permission to keep going. So now they're excavating the entire pool asylum, hopefully. I don't even, it might even be done by now. I don't know. I thought he was retiring. Well, Ellie's not doing it. Other people are doing gotcha. it. He is retired as an archaeologist. He's a, he's a guide now. Got it. Which yep. right now, you might want to pray for those people over there because there ain't no work, as sure. we say. Yeah, Nobody's I was going that over there. Earlier, um, mm -hmm. when you were mentioning the buses, mm -hmm. so, you know, tourism, all that stuff is mm -hmm. it's probably just all on hold and, mm -hmm. yeah, nothing going on. Now, it is. How about, um, you know, does Hamas or, or any of these, you know, or I hate to say terrorist organizations or whoever, are they, do they have any interest in excavating or archaeology or anything like that <laughs> that's a funny question or, there jeff <laughs> or or are they just kind of trying to destroy it all is what it seems like or archaeology in in israel is political right why well because there's always an argument over the land who owns the land right and uh the interesting thing is is ellie is excavating the city of david most of the people working with him are Muslims that come from the Silwan neighborhood right across the street on the other side of the Kidron Valley. And he's discovering stuff that affirm that the Jews were, were there for centuries, right. long before Islam. Of course, we know this. Islam didn't come along until, you know, the 600s A.D. Uh, the Jews have been in, in the area of the Holy Land since Joshua, 1400 B.C., and by the way, this is why it seems that many of the young people that today who are coming out in support of Hamas, first of all, you know that they don't know anything about history, okay? They think the Israelites are the occupiers right? because they don't know history, right? It would be like thinking that the history of Germany started in 1933 and the Nazis are the original Germans and the current government of Germany are the occupiers. And the Nazis deserve the land. Well, Hamas are basically modern-day Nazis. That's what they are. They want all the Jews dead. And many of the Christians and other non-Muslims, even some Muslims they want dead, right? That don't agree with them. This is a warped view of history. If you're going to say that the Israelites are the occupiers, you've got to ignore all history prior to 1948. That's basically what they do. They just ignore it. Yeah. But they don't know it. Isn't it interesting here? People think that 
Americans are the occupiers because the Native Americans had the land first. So we're the colonializers. You know, we're the, we're the evil people. By what moral standard they claim that that's wrong, I don't know. If they're atheists, they don't have a moral standard, but let's just go with it. Okay, we're the evil ones because we took land from people who were here before. But when you go over somehow to Israel, it flips. The evil people are the people that were there from the beginning. You notice that? The Palestinian, it wasn't even named Palestine until the second century AD by Hadrian. And the Muslims didn't show up, as you know. They didn't take Jerusalem until 638 AD. So why are the bad people, the indigenous people over there in Israel? Whereas here, the bad people are the colonializers. It's just it's so inconsistent. First of all, it, there is, a, let's admit, there's a bit of a problem with saying, I got here first. Okay, so it must be mine. I mean, you could go all the way back to Adam and Eve and argue over that stuff, right? But it is true that the Israelites have been in there long before there was any, anybody known as a Palestinian. If you're going to use that argument that the indigenous people have a right to the land, it's Israel. Yep. And I, I just remember um, seeing ISIS, uh, seeing ISIS when, when – um, they were going through palaces and, and when, when they were on a rampage, you know, several years ago. Mm -hmm. And they would just, you know, it's like they were seeking and destroying history. Mm -hmm. uh, they were going through these palaces, taking artwork and descriptions and just so many things and, and smashing them, burning They did. Them. As if, yeah, right, as if they were on a mission to do that. Well, that's uh, what happened in the great library of Alexandria when the Muslims took over that library um, sometime in the 7th century when one of the soldiers said to the guy in charge, hey, should we burn this library or not? And the guy basically said, well, if it's in agreement with the Quran, it's superfluous. If it's in disagreement with the Quran, it's heretical, so burn it. As if all the information comes from the Quran. Look, all the information in Christianity doesn't come from the Bible. There's a lot we, we know outside the Bible that's helpful, right? In fact, archaeology is outside the Bible. We've been talking about it here for, le you know, 12 lessons. So <laughs> most of what you know, you know outside the Bible. But for a Muslim to claim if it's against the Quran, it's heretical, and if it's in agreement with the Quran, it's superfluous. Well, what about if there's stuff in there that has nothing to do with the Quran that would be helpful to know? How about that? I, he's not thinking that way, is he? This is why in the Middle, Age, Middle Ages, Islam just stalled intellectually because all they would do is just concentrate on the Quran. Well, if the Quran is the word of God, then that's what they think, obviously. Okay, if you think it's the word of God, but don't you think there are some things that you ought to know outside the Quran? Apparently not. <laughs> Christians believe we ought to know. Christians believe God has written two books, right? He's inspired the Bible. What's the other book he's written? It's not the Quran, ladies and gentlemen. What is it? The book of nature. And in order to know what the book of the Bible says, you've got to know what the book of nature says first. What does the book of nature include? Language, logic, reason, cause and effect. You've got to know these things before you even look at the Bible, right? You just, in fact, the first verse of the Bible presupposes you know things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What does that presuppose you know? Well, it presupposes you know language, right? Presupposes you know what this being called God must be like, at least have some idea. What is, what is, who is God? Presupposes you know something about cause and effect. He created. Presupposes you know there's a creation. Right? It presupposes all these things. You don't get that from the Bible. You need those principles in order to understand what the Bible says. So it's ludicrous to say burn everything that's outside the Quran, even if the Quran is the word of God, which it isn't. Right. We need the mic move up, if you don't mind. Going back to Abraham, uh -huh. uh, when God promised Abraham all the land, yeah, 
Well, that goes plumb up into Iraq, Iran, Libya, Syria. Yeah, you are correct. <laughs> but now uh, <coughs> Israel hadn't claimed that land yet unless it was maybe through uh, Ishmael, Abraham's other son. What do you think about that? Well, no, you're right that the area that it appears God promised to Abraham extended from the river Euphrates all the way to the Nile River. How far east it went, uh, that's questionable. But Israel never had all that land. Never had all of it. So what's going to happen in the future? Well, the whole world's going to be under the, under the judgment of Christ, as you know. Yes, go ahead. Well, that was an awesome answer about using history in a generation that's mm -hmm. irrelevant as we think, well, wasn't the Treaty of 1992 the reason that Eastern Europe should be so-and-so? Like, not recognizing a thousand years of history gets us into problems today, right? Mm -hmm. Like, without that wisdom. So I thank you. Uh, your slide up there, I had the pleasure of this June being in Israel, and I, th I think that was the pit where Jeremiah got put into it was fascinating that you said some of his the coins, those mullahs, were found. But if that was an administrative center, is that you think possible that you know this troublemaker of a prophet kept got put in those pits? And well, I think we don't exactly right know where the cistern was in which uh, Jeremiah was thrown, but it was probably in this area somewhere. There is a cistern that Ellie took us into uh, over here on the other side of the of the palace, and I said, "Do you think this is Jeremiah's cistern?" He didn't think so, but it could have been. Someone up here? Reggie, do you have something? Got anything online? All right, we'll go to it right after Reggie. Go ahead. I thought it was interesting uh, in all this, uh, you know, stuff that's going on with Hamas and Israel right now, they've been showing some of these old maps. The British uh -huh. uh, mandate showed the amount that was going to be given to Israel was all the way to the Euphrates, like, mm -hmm. like when originally. And then the, the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan of other kingdom said they wanted some and so they carved off that section and initially they were supposed to get almost the whole section that god had promised them based on on uh the, the british mandate yeah the british mandate originally was supposed to give most of jordan to israel too and then um actually winston churchill divided all that up after world war one and then ultimately after world war two um israel got this small sliver that they have now instead of the Transjordan and Jordan, that whole area became, as we now know, the Kingdom of Jordan. Yep. All right, let's go to uh, Clint up here. and We'll take a few from out there. Do you think we'll see more than 1% being unearthed? And, you know, how is that process going of, I guess, the... The, the Holy Land? Yeah. There's always people going to the Holy Land and digging. But you have to get a permit, and you can only do it certain months of the year. And sometimes after you leave the area, you know, locals come in and fill it back in or mess with it. They can't guard the area. So it's a hard thing to do uh, over there in the Holy Land. But, yeah, there are people digging all the time. Uh, Scott Stripling is an archaeologist that goes over there quite a bit. Titus Kennedy, a guy we've used some of the material from or in, the, in this course goes over that way. Um, there are several archeologists that go over there. Many of them, of course, are minimalists. In fact, there's a guy here that teaches at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, James Tabor, who's a minimalist. He goes over there, he digs. Um, so there are, there are plenty, but look, Israel has, what, about eight million people in it? It's about the size of New Jersey. And uh, they're building settlements all the time. They need, they need land, so. Um, they they just can't dig wherever they want to dig. What else we got? Um, are there any other pieces of evidence of David? Um, I feel like I recall some inscriptions on tablets with King David's name or at least references to the city of David. There are three uh, references, inscriptions uh, for David. We've covered two of them. One is the Tel Dan Stella we talked about earlier, and the second is the Moabite Stone, which we talked about earlier as well. Now, there's a third one I can't remember right now, but there are three inscriptions of David uh, that have been found. Uh, and by the way, the Tel Dan and the Moabite Stone 
are inscriptions about David from foreign governments. They're not from the Israelites. They're from the king of Aram, the Tel Dan Stella, and the king of Mesha, the king of Moab, and the Moabites don't. So it's not even Israelites writing this stuff down. It's, it's, their, it's their neighbors, their enemies. Anything else? All right. Anybody else in here? Let's go over to Ross if we can. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, there's so many books you can get on this stuff. Titus Kennedy just released another book. Well, it's actually coming out in January. We'll have him on the show for. But if you want to see most of the major discoveries, probably the best place to go, at least to get an overview of it, is go to the Expedition Bible YouTube channel by Joel Kramer. Go ahead, Ralph. So, so when they came to excavate um, the city of David, how did they know where to start looking? And did it look like anything like it looks like now? I mean, obviously a lot has happened since, you know, with, with I don't know, uh, the way that, that the city looks today because of the excavation, but what did, did it just look like a side of a hill before that? Um, well, Charles Warren knew where to look. He found Warren Shaft, as you know, that was in 1867. And then McAllister came along, and there were probably other archaeologists that came along as well. I can't think of all of them, but they knew where the city of David was. Um, it's, uh, in fact, you can, you can look at older pictures of the whole area and see, still see this defined area known as the city of David. And uh, so they, they knew and always have known where the city of David was. As they say, in David's time, all the stuff we think about in Jerusalem didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So they've, uh, and as I say, they, they've excavated more of the city of David than most sites. I don't know how much, but when you go there, it's like they're digging everywhere in the city of David. But there are also a lot of people living there, so it's a little bit difficult to dig everywhere. Right. Okay, thank you. All right. Gary, go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned, Frank, that the locals live nearby. Just yeah. out of curiosity, how close do they live, and what do they say about people coming in, tourists and diggers, tearing up this land? And do they say anything? Yeah, well, that was King David's palace right there, so what? What, what do they say about it? Well, I don't know, because locals aren't going to publish stuff, right? Okay. It's the professional archaeologists that publish right. stuff. But, they don't, but locals they don't. want jobs, right? Sure. If I can get a job digging up, I don't care. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll dig as long as you want. Yeah. Help, you know. Okay. Especially in the Silwan area. How close is it? They walk there. It's just You can walk from Silwan to, to the city of David. Gotcha. I mean, even in the highest part of Silwan, it may take you 15 minutes to walk to the site, but hmm. you're just walking down a hill into a valley and up another hill. It's right there. All right. All right. So we're going to have some prayer here. So we're going to say goodbye.